topic I'm going to do today is the technology acceptance model and its various extensions over about 10 years. Now, the reason for doing it is to try to understand why we as humans actually use any systems, IT related or otherwise. The particular focus of the technology acceptance models is around why and how we use things on here, on PCs, computers in general. What are the factors that are necessary for us to really buy into using them? One of the things that will be done next week, while I'm away in um, the IBM conference next week, will be that Winnie will come and give you the uh, lecture on who the stakeholders are who actually are involved in defining and owning and using a system. What I want to cover today, particularly, if we look, go back to the Zachman Enterprise architecture, which we looked at yes, last week or the week before? Last week. In the context of the top two levels of the Zachman Enterprise architecture, there are things happening there that we can apply the technology acceptance models to understanding what do we need to do to make it possible or even ideal for the users to actually use these systems. Why do we try out new systems? Why do we then go on and continue using them? What is it in the human nature that actually makes this happen? And on the other side of the coin is, what is it that makes us reject them without even thinking virtually? There are some systems we are very, very happy with, and there are other systems which we really get very, very irritated with for some reason, and we stop using them very quickly. Now, we know that on these gadgets, the typical smart device, smartphone, probably has 50 or 60 apps loaded on, and the average user probably uses about half a dozen of those. They just can't be bothered to wipe them off. What is it, what's the difference between the ones which we use all the time, the ones we use occasionally, and the ones we almost never ever use, and then eventually get round to wiping them out when we need a bit of space. So, some research was carried out, and we find from IT services management ideas, we're talking about the top levels, the planner, the owner. IT product design, the module that De uh, Dennis is running, takes you down to the next two layers. And at those four layers, <coughs> there are going to be sort of issues to do with human behavior, human perceptions, human understanding, us in general. And if you go right back to the beginning of the century, actually quite a bit before, actually, 1989, Davis did some research and came up with the first draft, the first version of the technology acceptance model. We said, in terms of actual use at the end, we start off here. There's things that are going on outside the system, outside of human the human involvement that might be affecting whether we perceive the system, the app, to be useful or not. And also, perhaps, we have to do with the perception of how easy the system is to use. And he proposed that a mixture of those interacting 
lead towards some sort of human attitude to a propensity or a desire, maybe to try it out, to use it. And so, so some of us are the early adopters. So we like to start trying out things, see where they work, whether they're useful, whether they're valuable, whether they're easy to use, and so on. Others are the far end, the laggards of the adoption curve. And they will wait until everybody else is using it and prove that it's worthwhile using. It's not too difficult, and it's worthwhile the investment to try and learn how to use it. He said, this attitude leads towards an intention to use it. I've got us a propensity to use it, because I like to start being at the head lead. Probably affected by, do I think it's going to be useful to me or not? Will help me to feel, I better try it out. Leads to actual use. Now, an IT service is of absolutely no value in relation to its investment if no one is actually using it. So here is a clue to one of the answers towards the back end of your assignment, how to measure the success of your, your IT service that you're creating. But it's also helps you as a blueprint to think about the design right up front. Helps you to think about, is it my idea, big data, IoT type stuff, new service. Think about those four boxes, if you th or the five boxes. Are they going to lead to a service which is worthwhile, that people like to use, want to use, because it's valuable to them. So you can use this as a means of working out whether your idea is even worth bothering about. A few definitions from Davis's paper. And this was put back into the context of work. But it also seems to apply to apps which don't affect our work, the things that sit on here. So you can see the job orientation here. The degree to which a person believes that using a particular system would enhance his or her job performance. And this was done in, in relation to some research about using in-company email systems. So it kind of dates the whole project. But today, we don't even think about using email. Everybody uses email. But back in the 80s, it was a big issue. To see these reviews, the degree to which a person believes that using a particular system would be free from effort. We like to free ride. We don't like putting in effort if we can possibly avoid it. That's because we're humans. <coughs> In essence, we are kind of lazy. So he built a questionnaire about the email system that the particular company was using. And here's a set of questions, eight questions, that help to understand whether a system, the email system, was going to be useful. Does it improve my job performance? Does it help me to communicate and address my job-related needs? Does it save me time? I can do things more quickly. It allows me to accomplish more work than would otherwise be possible. Well, I think we've all know now the research shows that email actually slows you all down. So kind of a difficult one to point. Plus another few questions here. We now know, actually, 30 odd years on, email, social media, divert us, they slow us down. It increases the number of unproductive activities, actually. But back then, this was the focus. 
So you can't use these 14 questions today as a real definition of perceived usefulness. You'll have to invent new ones in the way that you think about perceived usefulness scales. But it gives you a feel what was being discussed 30 odd years ago. The world moves on. You could change the email all the way through and replace them with your new service. And that might give you a, some interesting insights into a way that you could actually design your system, your service, to be valuable. It's got to do something that helps people do their job or to do their hobby more effectively, more quickly, more easily, without too much effort. So if you replace electronic mail all the way through with your new IT service, maybe this will help you to understand how to target at your potential customer. Ease of use. Well, last year you did the, sort of the HCI interface in your first year module with Dennis, and I guess you're kind of doing a bit of that in IT product development this term, aren't you? And then when you do IT project, uh, pr uh, team project with Dennis, again, you've got to think about the ease of use with your little systems you're going to be designing for your clients. How many of you use LinkedIn now? Quite a few. A few. How many of you have used it for more than a year or so? Anybody? I'm still discovering new things I can do with it, which I'm sure were built in originally. So explore these systems to find out. And yeah, we do have to explore them. There are no user guides any longer for anything, virtually. You've all used Turnitin, I guess, haven't you? And I discovered with the first year students um, a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago, there are at least two rather interesting undisclosed design features of Turnitin which are not mentioned anywhere on the submission page. One is that you must have at least 20 or perhaps 21 or two or three words on the piece of paper that, or the document you are submitting, otherwise it doesn't like it. The other one is that there is actually a, fa a firm size limit not quite sure where it is, but I know that a couple of guys were trying to submit 80 megabyte um, documents and it kind of blew up and said, no, you can't do it. <coughs> so they had to sort of experiment. There are no user guides. We have to work it out. So maybe we do make errors frequently when we're trying to use system X or service X. Um, Maybe we would like to do number four, but unfortunately there isn't one. They're not even, on some systems, there are not even help buttons to press. So how do you find out? Ease of use is to do with mental effort. We're lazy. We don't like mental effort. Recovering from errors. So many of our systems we use, it gets difficult. We're not quite sure what will happen. Particularly when it's our credit card and our debit card and money that, and PayPal that is at risk. Do I go to the next stage? Will it nick the money now or will it take it two more steps? What happens if it goes wrong in the middle? Will I lose money? We kind of feel nervousness, folks. Yeah. How rigid and inflexible is it? Can I do what I want to do? How many of the systems and the apps we use behave in unexpected ways sometimes? Not always, but sometimes it has a blow to fuse. Again, put your new service name there in place of electronic mail system and see how that affects the perceived ease of use for your service. 
Because so what TAM is trying to get you to do is to have a higher rating for each of those so that people really will want to try that service out. A couple of thoughts that came out of the research that Davis did um, with these users of the company email system was that for many people, usefulness was more important than ease of use or usability. If it was useful, delivered value to the person, then they were more likely to persevere with it and use it. This was kind of interesting back then because at that stage in 1989, <coughs> there was a lot of debate around about making systems easy to use. And this was a key piece of research that actually ease of use is not quite as important as being useful. So what does that do to your assignment, folks? The knowledge that usefulness is more important in a service than ease of use, how does that affect the topic that you're going to write about? Because it's fundamentally that analysis system or that presentational system or whatever it is you're doing with your large data. Is it going to be useful to some people? And why will it be useful? If you can't answer that right at the very beginning, you may well have chosen the wrong sort of thing. But then, he says, a different sort of thing. To do with functionality, does it do what it's supposed to do, depends on that usability factor. So you've got to balance usability and or ease of use with the value that it delivers. Now, a few years later, like 11, he worked with a research a PhD student, Venkatesh, and they published a new one which actually expanded upon the left-hand edge of the original technology acceptance model and expanded all of these external factors, trying to find out not what's going on with the perceived usefulness and perceived use, but what were those external factors, the things that actually help people to really want to try and do it. Things like peer pressure, uh, image, relevance to the job, quality, and so on. And this one here is rather fun. Are you required to use it or do you use it because you want to do it? And in the company environment, often it was, you've got no option, guys, you will use it. And that kind of puts people's backs up. So Venkatesh and Davis produced this TAM2 with some factors <coughs> which allow you to begin to understand what the pressures are in terms of driving people either to think it's more useful or less useful. And the papers in the bibliography at the back uh, are there, so you can actually go and download the original three or four papers that this uh, session is all related to. You can see on page 20, 201 of the paper, this, the Venkatesh and Davis paper, um, the various questions which expand on these sections here. What, what, what sort of questions were they asking to begin to get some a handle on how people were looking at that. As a result of yet more work, Venkatesh and a few others, again, all PhD students of Davis came up with the new version. They said, okay, TAM1, TAM2, yeah, not too bad, but let's change it around a bit because we've now done a whole lot of uh, analysis of lots and lots of factors in today's terminology that you'll be using in analytics, these are so-called predictive analytics, where they looked at these factors to see which one has the most impact on the way that behavioral intention is developing. Excuse me a minute. Oh, I took my 
Oh, I saw it. Hold on. Hello? Sorry about that, folks. <coughs> so, where were we? Yeah. Um, so, they were doing multi, uh, so analytic techniques that are doing uh, multi way correlation, really, to see which of these are the most important factors that drive the behavioral intention that leads to actually using the service. And you'll find all the questions there, the factors and the weightings that help them lead to that. So what you will need to do, and by the way, there's actually UAT2, UTA, UT2, two and three, I think now, that's moved it on. So if you look for those, it will help you to understand really how do you organize and design a new service that actually is going to be valuable to people in a way that they will actually pick it up Try it out, and then use it. Now, get the four or five, four sources that are in the bibliography, and look for the other ones more up to date. You'll need to go to some, uh, probably to look inside um, Emerald and EBSCO sources, and perhaps you'll find them also in ACM Digital. But EBSCO and Emerald will be the main source for those articles on UTA, UT, UTA, UT 2 and 3. But also, not don't find just the original articles published by Venkatesh and Davis and Davis's team. Find other sources through the electronic journal environment to find the critiques of why people think that TAM and UTAUT and others are valuable, and also those articles where people are arguing exactly the opposite. You need to get those articles on both sides, positive and negative. And then, using TAM2 and Tap UTA, UT1 and 2 and 3, work out what are the very fundamental questions, the very fundamental issues that designers of new services need to think about in order to drive or to develop a service which people are going to use for the purpose that it's designed for, that it has the appropriate ease of use but also, and more importantly, the usefulness. So they will use it. It doesn't become one of those millions of apps out there that have been uploaded half a dozen times and then deleted, or even 10,000 times and deleted because they don't do anything useful. So what are those critical issues that at level one and level two in the enterprise architecture are really fundamental in terms of developing that new service. Here are five starter for 10 um, references that are very easy to get hold of. So that's that one. In terms of what you need to be doing both now and 
later on this evening, or on third, uh, when you have a second one. The workshop activity. So we've got the basic picture of what needs to be done. Now, the fundamental questions, an approach to build it into your works, in the workshop activity, and then into your assignments. Remember, your workshops are all about developing your assignment. First of all, building on to what was in the last set of slides, now find some more that critically evaluate the success of those models. There are examples where it works brilliantly. There are examples where it ain't so good. Yeah, Athens, Google Scholar, use whatever sources are going to help you find the, the relevant papers. What are the questions that come from TAM2, UTUT, <coughs> UTA, UT2, and 3 that help you to work out how to define what the, knowledge, the body of data is you're going to use and the service you're going to develop around it? At both the level of the planner and then at the owner. Going back to the Sackman Enterprise architecture and think about the who, how, why, where, when um, questions at those two levels. Yeah, <clears throat> we'll be able to have a discussion, or you should be able to have a discussion about this, maybe this afternoon, this evening, or certainly next week. But you also should, by now, be able to start using this to think about using a, uh, the, these two frameworks to help you design it and then evaluate it later on. So that sets out the tasks for this week. I brought this forward partly because it makes life easier in one sense. It gives you a way of getting into the design your service at a much earlier stage. We'll pick up the stakeholders next week and then we'll pick up that other one which was we'll also pick up the idea of business services for business needs a little bit later on because getting started with this user end is probably the most important thing for you. The usefulness is critical. Then we can start thinking about services a bit later on. Okay, let's close this down.